So I run VO Solutions. We provide drivers for events and clearly during the pandemic, our, our market has pretty much dropped completely. So we've been working with Tony from before the pandemic and since, just looking at different ways that we can contract with our customers, find opportunities um, and move forward. And we found his, his skills and tips really helpful. So as a BBF member, I wanted to share his knowledge and expertise with other members. Um, so that's why Tony is here. So I'll hand over to Tony now. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for that introduction. Well, guys, morning and, and welcome. It's a real honour and a privilege, actually, to be speaking to you now because I've BBF's had such huge success supporting their members and anything I can do to add value to that, I'm delighted. Just a very, very brief introduction of those of you who've never worked with me, have never heard of me. Um, I run Tony Morris International, which is a global sales training organisation. I've personally spoken and delivered in 25 countries. I've worked with just over 30,000 sales professionals all over the world in about 62 different industries. I've written five books on sales. I will email you the names of all of them so you can buy them, they're fantastic. And uh, the reason I share that, guys, is everything I'm gonna talk about in the next hour is real life. I don't talk any theory. And everything I share, you will be able to implement into your business to have the success that you really deserve. Um, Josh Hall is gonna be facilitating the chat room. So if you have any questions as I share some ideas, please put it in the chat box and Josh is gonna interrupt me and share the question. Um, and, I, um, and I'm gonna also leave about 15 minutes at the end for any questions about, specifically about your business, your role, of how you can implement some of the things I'm gonna talk about. But I'm gonna share with you seven ideas, seven strategies, seven techniques of how to sell when no one is buying. And the first thing I wanna talk about is that, that sentence, how to sell when no one is buying. And, and I, I titled that, the, this session on purpose because I actually believe our job is not to sell. So when I say how to sell when no one is buying, I believe our job as salespeople, as business owners who are looking to acquire new clients and retain clients is actually not to sell. Why do I say that? Because no one likes to be sold to. You know what it's like, you go into a shop um, when we're allowed with a mask and a salesperson jumps on you and says, hi, how can I help? And you're like, leave me alone. You know, I've just walked in. And, and you immediately feel a bit cheesed off. But you are there to buy, or at least maybe browse and look around, but you don't like to feel you're being sold to. So the, the how to sell is a bit of a myth because I don't believe we sell. I believe our job is to help people buy. I believe my job, having been in sales for 22 years, I see myself as a problem solver. Every prospect I speak to has a pain, has a problem, or has a goal that they want to realize. And my job is twofold, to help them solve their problems or realize their goals and aspirations. And if I can help them do that, then I'm winning. Then I'm helping them, I'm serving them. But I'm never selling to anyone. So I really wanted to start this session of you understanding that your job is never to sell. Your job is to help, your job is to serve, and your job is to solve your prospects' problems. And when I say how to sell when no one is buying, it's not true. People are buying. All of you have made purchases during this lockdown. Um, I know if I look at myself, yes, I've been purchasing food, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. So we are buying. I'm actually in the process of buying a holiday home right now because life is good and I, it's been a goal I've had for many years. And, and I went to Cotswold last weekend to view four properties to buy a holiday home. So it's a myth that people aren't buying. Yes, in your businesses, they might not be buying as often. The frequency might be down. The value order might be less, but they are still buying. There is still a need for what you do it's just how you package it and how you position it. And what I found in this 
pandemic is my business has absolutely thrived because I've learned how to adapt. So as I mentioned, I do global sales training. All of my training was worldwide where I'm sitting in a boardroom delivering content. And on the end of March, when this happened, my, I had 16 retained clients, 14 of them canceled me. 14 of them within, honestly, within two hours, email me saying, Tony, it's on hold. And I, I remember speaking to my wife that evening, feeling pretty awful and saying, what the hell am I going to do? And she said to me, what do you do? What's your job? And, and I, I said, well, I run a sales training company. She said, that's not what you do. What do you actually do? And I said, well, I help people sell more. And she said, how do you do that? And I said, I stand in front of them and I teach. And she said, well, you can't do that anymore, but you can still educate, inspire and teach them. You just got to change the platform. I now have 13 clients, the two that I originally had and 11 new ones that I am educating and inspiring virtually. So all that had to change was my medium. And the reason I share that guys is I don't know what all of your businesses are. I know they're all going to be different, but look at this as an opportunity, probably the biggest opportunity a lot of us have ever had to change and adapt. And I, I hate the word pivot. I'm just finding everyone's using that word. It's a bit irritating, but I would change it to innovate and, and look at your business slightly differently to deliver to your clients. And I know it, this has honestly transformed my company for the better and I'm loving life. And I feel quite bad saying that to some people because not everyone else is maybe having the success that myself or some of my clients are having, but that might be because they've not worked out how to adapt yet. And let me tell you guys, this is the new world. We don't know how long this new world's gonna last, but it's gonna be many years. And therefore, now is the time to understand how we can adapt accordingly. So the first thing I wanna say in this new world, the first strategy I want you to think about is a routine. Because this is the new way of working, what is your routine? Because I don't know about you, but I used to sort of, during lockdown, I've been getting up at like nine o'clock, been having a nice leisurely breakfast, playing with my kids. And I might make calls at like 10 o'clock. I might start my day. And I realized that's not how I'd have worked before lockdown. So why have I stopped working how I did? And it's because I've, I've lost my routine. So I've now developed a routine that works for me. My routine that my clients are doing is we're up at 6.30 like I used to be. I, I do a workout first thing in the morning because I think, first of all, physically and mentally, it's vital. I, I can't go to the gym anymore, or although it's open, I'm still a bit uncomfortable with it. So I've signed up to beachbody.com, eight pounds a month, and now I can work out in the comfort of my own home, doing actually a workout that I prefer. So if you've not heard of that, check that out. There's a free one called fitnessblender.com, free of charge. And again, I'm using that just to mentally and physically feel fresh before my day begins. But I set a routine. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if any of you experience this, but I, I start, normally I'm at my desk now about quarter past eight doing my emails. And before I know it, it's half past 11 and my morning has run away with me. And I suddenly think, what have I actually achieved? Well, I've cleared my email deck but I've not achieved anything. I've been an email responder. And if I allowed my day to respond to emails, I would actually achieve nothing. So I, I'm very disciplined now, and, and I've set up a system in my Outlook, and I've, in my in folder, I call it the AAA folder, because it's right at the top. And in my AAA folder, I have three folders, today, this week, and future. And the first thing I do at quarter past eight, I check my emails and anything that is a priority goes into today. Anything that isn't a priority goes into this week. And anything that I just don't want to deal with now goes into future. And I make sure before my day is finished, I make sure my today folder is cleared. And that might mean 10 o'clock at night I do my today folder, however I operate. 
And I do email checkpoints. Every two hours, I do an email checkpoint. So I actually turn Outlook off because sometimes it's a disturbance, it's a distraction. And when I look at my emails at quarter past 10, again, I go through today, this week, future. And then I'm not allowing the emails to control me. I control my emails. I'm giving myself a routine that works for me. And all I focus on in my day is two things. It's only what I focus on every day. Income generating or opportunity generating. Because if I, so right now I might be doing, I'm doing a webinar at no cost to any of you, but I see this as opportunity generating because hopefully I'm going to give you some ideas that will serve your business. And you'll think, you know what? I want to work with Tony. He can really help my business. Therefore, it's an opportunity generation. And on average, I do two hours of opportunity generating every day. The rest of my time is all income generating where I'm being paid for my time to deliver. And if it's not income generating, I'm doing opportunity generating. If I focus on just those two things every day, my business will thrive, as will yours. But so many salespeople, directors, business owners are focusing on things that doesn't earn them income and doesn't generate opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to have to do admin tasks during your day. But you choose when you do those admin tasks. So you could do it at 11 a.m., but I would argue at 11 a.m. is your opportunity to speak to your clients and generate opportunity or speak to prospective clients and generate opportunity. You might not better do that at 5.30 p.m., but you can do admin. So you need to choose the time you have available. Guys, I mentioned at the beginning of today, of this session, I've served over 30,000 salespeople and I've interviewed the top 1%. These are the best salespeople in the world. And I've interviewed them on my podcast, Confessions of a Serial Seller. If you're into podcasts, write it down. Confessions of a Serial Seller. That's not killer, that's seller. Very different podcast. And one thing that I've noticed with these top performers, these are people that are earning a million pounds a year and upwards, is this. They have the same time as us. They just use it differently. They don't have any more hours in the day, guys. There's no tricks to this. All they do is they use those nine hours in the daytime more productively than anybody else. And they are disciplined with that time. And they use that time to speak to existing clients, to work with them and serve them more. So they spend more with them or they use them to get referrals from those existing clients. And if they're not doing that, they are speaking to prospective clients that they could help and serve. Everything else is noise. So the first thing I want you to think about, the first tip is, do you have a routine that is serving you? Or do you have a routine that is disturbing you from doing more business? And I used to listen to a guy called Richard Denny, who unfortunately passed away two years ago. He was a, an incredible motivational speaker. And one thing Denny said that really resonated with me is this. If you don't have a goal, you can't score. So my question is, what are you aiming at every day? And every single day I set one goal, every day. It might be to reach out to three inactive clients I've not spoken to for two years to see how they're doing, how business is, and how can I best serve them. That might be a goal. And when you set a goal, you, you tend to aim for it. If you're, especially if you're motivated, you think, I'm not finishing my day until I've reached three inactive clients. And that might take 10 phone calls to reach three. But you tend to go for it if you set a goal. It's a bit like when you go to the gym and you set a specific goal, you tend to go for it and you either, you either achieve it or sometimes you exceed it, but you go for it. And if you don't have a goal, you don't tend to aim for something. So I, th I think that's a really important thing is what are the goals you're setting yourself? And I have a goal board that I use and every morning when I'm doing my email 
discipline. I then write with a chalkboard, what's my goal for the day? So at least at the end of my day, I feel a sense of achievement and purpose. And it gives you that wonderful feeling that you know what, today's been useful, I've achieved. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is this. One of the guys I interviewed on my podcast is a guy called Art Subcheck. He is a, a sales god. He was the first book I ever read on sales was called Smart Calling, written by Art. And he's just posted me last week, his fourth edition, which, which was incredible. And I was very blessed. He invited me onto his podcast, which to me was like a bucket list goal. It was incredible how things turn out. But something he said to me really struck me and it was really powerful. And he said this, he said, Tony, no one ever graduates from the school of selling. And this is a guy who is in the hall of fame for sales. He's been in sales for 48 years and he's still learning. And in my podcast to him, he said, I taught him three things he's never thought about in sales. As I said, this is a guy who's been top of his game. He's a multi-millionaire from sales and he's still learning. And the truth is, if Roger Federer still has a coach, what, what excuse can we all make? And some of you might be in furlough right now. And if you are, you're not allowed to work in your business, but they don't say you can't work on yourself. So my recommendation is, what are you doing to invest in yourself daily to develop. So one thing I do as part of my daily routine is I allocate half an hour a day to learn, to study and invest on myself. At the moment, I'm reading a book called e It's sorry, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. If you've not read it, it's one of the best business books I've ever, ever read. If you're in a sort of a franchise business, it's the best book you'll ever read. But if you're looking to maybe franchise or create a subscription business, which I'm in the process of doing, I would recommend Emith. And, and I'm, um, yeah, Radislaw's read it as well. Great book. And I'm very blessed. Michael Gerber is coming on my podcast in three weeks. He is an absolute guru. But the point I'm making, guys, is are you spending time on yourself and developing yourself? And it depends what your preferred method is. I love to read, but you might listen to audio books or watch videos or webinars. And the fact that you're all, you've allocated an hour today to watch me and hopefully learn from me shows me you're open to learning. But don't do it as a one off because learning is habitual. And unless you do it on a regular basis, you won't change your habits and you won't achieve the goals that you deserve. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes read something or learn something. I think, oh, I love that and do nothing with it. And I find that so infuriating. So that what I've developed to avoid that happening is what I call my sales Bible. And any time I learn anything new, I write it in my sales Bible. It might be a word that I really like the sound of. It might be a, a question Someone gives me a great, asks me a great question. I think I love that. I'm going to use that. It goes into my sales Bible. And, and, and I look at my Bible every three to four weeks to remind myself of some of the great things I must implement. And, and last week was my last entry into my Bible. It was on Friday. And I was speaking to an email campaign company. Um, and because I'd reached out to them. And I was unhappy with MailChimp that I was using. And I spoke to this company and he said, Tony, tell me, why are you looking to upgrade to us? And I thought, what a clever question. Upgrade to us. Because I wasn't upgrading in my head. I was switching. I was changing. But he positioned it of upgrading. And I loved it. And straight away, when I got off that phone call, I entered that word upgrade into my, my Bible. And now that's in my head. I'll be using that every time. But it would have been really easy to forget. So I would recommend, guys, if you don't have one, build your own sales Bible. I've got about 15 now that I've developed over the last 21 years in my sales career. But as I said, I entered something last Friday because we are always learning. And I use this now in my company. 
So I've got two sales advisors who work for me and we got an inquiry last week from a massive bank, this huge bank in America. And I, and I listen and I get all of my salespeople to record every call because part of my coaching is I want to listen to their calls, give them feedback. And on the sales call, I was listening to Sarah's call and, and she shared how we, she believes we can help them, but she didn't listen. She didn't um, make a note of a success story that we've helped other banks like them. It was a company called Morgan Stanley. And, and I said, we've helped UBS. We've also helped um, uh, Exane, BNP, Paribas. And I said to Sarah, why didn't you mention them? And she said, I didn't know we helped them. Whose fault was that? My fault. I didn't give her the knowledge that she needed to articulate our success in that space. So one thing I've developed is a knowledge Bible. And, and I think it's a really important thing that I would recommend. You know, if, if you've got certain knowledge in your head and you want the rest of your team to, to know the same level of knowledge, then how are you helping them do it? And what I've created is what I call an A to Z of success. Let me show you. And hopefully this is value for you. So I'm just going to share the screen with you. Um, Rachel, can you just confirm, put your thumbs up. Can you see this page? Yeah, excellent. So guys, this is a, 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 an example of one of my clients, actually. I train a promotional merchandise company and I've helped them develop their A to Z. But here's a good example. So they, the a, they created this in Excel spreadsheet in, and they've worked with about 45 industries. So they split it A to Z. And just an example, their B is banking, like mine. And one banking client they've worked with is Metro. So they've split their A to Z by industry, by clients they've served in the industry, how they've helped that client, and most importantly, what's the result been? So they, if, as a good example, if you go into any Metro bank and you're using a Metro pen, this company has provided those branded pens for them. But if they got an inquiry from any bank, they can say with confidence, oh, we've helped the likes of Metro by providing all of the pens in their branches. And immediately it builds credibility and confidence to that, in, that prospect that this company's already helped a massive player like Metro. And I've done exactly the same Hello. with my sales team. So, so I'm, on, I'm on a web meeting. So guys, my recommendation for you is build a knowledge Bible. And one of the things I wanted my sales team to learn was who we've helped and how we help them. I, I mentioned, I think earlier, we've helped 62 industries. So some of the letters, there's three, for example, there's three D's in my business. One is data rooms. Another one is database companies. Um, so I've given an example there of who we've served, how we've helped them in terms of the training we've delivered and what the results are. But I can't be annoyed with my sales team if I've not provided them with the knowledge. And one thing that I've learned with the e-myth is this. Treat your business as if you want to franchise it. Now, you know, if you look at the McDonald's business, I don't know if anyone's seen the film The Founder. If you haven't, it's one of the best films I've seen. I saw it again last night to remind myself how good it was because they talk about an e-myth. And what Ray Kroc, who wasn't the creator of McDonald's, by the way, he took the idea, if you've seen the movie, is he didn't create a hamburger business. He created a systems business. And he created it that he could give that recipe, not the burger recipe, the business recipe to anyone to create a successful business. And that's why McDonald's is one of the most successful businesses of our time. But he's created a map, a roadmap of how to run a McDonald's business. And he said, to have a super successful business, we've all heard the saying, don't work in your business, work on your business. But the way to do it is to create a roadmap that you could almost hand to someone of how to run your business. 
And it's something I'm in the process of building that A, I may franchise my business one day, but if not, I can give someone a book to say, this is how to run a very successful global sales training organization. And, and I give that now to my sales team so they can never ask me, Tony, how do I do this? Because I could say, it's in the book. Check out the book. This is how you deal with a call. This is what an email should look like. This is when you're doing some social media posting, this is what you should do. If you're doing a, a smart call where you're looking at, not cold call, a smart call, this is how it should look and sound. And I have created the perfect Bible for them. Other ideas for the Bible before I move on. I don't know if you guys remember the game Top Trumps, but I love that game. I play that with my kids now. Randomly, I actually train the company called Winning Moves, who have the sole license in the UK for Top Trumps and Monopoly. But that's by the by. But what they've done is I've created top trumps in my business. I look at my competitors and think, how do I trump them? So I've actually designed, with the help of winning moves, top trumps. And I play that top trumps game with my sales team. So on a Friday, to make light of a meeting, make it a bit more lighthearted and fun, they know the competitors we normally come up against. And we play top trumps. So they know my strengths, as in my organization, compared to my competitors. And we don't talk negatively about them, we trump them. So as an example, just to give you a simple example, I've built a platform called TMI University. It's all of my content online. There's days and days and days and days of content. Uh, and I know Josh Hall, who's on this call, has been on it, has really, I think, benefited from it. A lot of my sales competitors don't do that. So one of my trumps is, what do you do when you deliver training? How do you reinforce it on a daily basis so that your team can build the best habits that serve them? We can say we have a platform called TMI University. Many of my competitors can't say that. So that's an immediate trump. So my question to you guys is, how are you trumping your competitors do your sales team know how to articulate that? And I'm not talking about USPs, unique selling points. I believe USPs are selfish because it's about you and your company. It should always be about your client. I call it UCB, unique client benefits. So how do your clients uniquely benefit from your product or service? So the way my team position the university is your sales team will be able to learn forever and build up the right habits that will serve them forever because they get a lifetime membership of the university. That is a UCB in my company, not a USP, which is very selfish, in my opinion. Tip number three, are you fishing in the right pond? What do I mean by that? I often say to, to businesses, who's your target audience? And they say those dreaded words, we can serve anyone. So then I say to them, can, can five-year-old children use your products and services? And they say, no, don't be ridiculous. So I say, then you can't serve everyone, can you? So you've got to be very clear, who are you serving? Who is your niche? Now, there's nothing wrong in having more than one niche. In my company, I mentioned 62 industries. That's who we have reactively served. But proactively, we serve five niches. One of them is estate agents. But that's just one of my niches. And how did I understand who is the best niche for my business? I looked at track records. So what I did, I've run my company for 14 years and I learned this by a guy, a company called Action Coach and the founder of Action Coach is a guy called Brad Sugars, who's a, an incredible successful businessman. Action Coach is one of the most successful franchises of his time. And one thing Brad taught me is grade your clients. He said, if you want success, super success, you need to know who you serve. And he said, grade your clients. So he said, look at all of your clients 
and break them down into four grades, grade A to grade D. And let me just explain what he explained to me. Grade A is your most profitable clients or it's the clients you just love serving. They're your grade A. So they're your biggest, most profitable clients or ones you just love working with. Grade B are your bread and butter. These are your regular clients that you work with. Your grade C's are your one-offs. So these are clients that might phone me and book me for a one event, maybe speaking at a conference, but there's no real need for what I do. And grade D are my dead clients. They, they don't know they're my dead clients, but that's how I call them. These are ones who, who pay me the least, but give me the biggest headache. All of us have got grade D clients. So it took me about six hours to do this. I went through my 321 clients and I graded them. Tom, I'll come to you in two seconds with that question. Um, but I, and Josh, if you ask it to me just when I finish this point, but I, I broke down my clients and I graded all of them. And I realized when I did that, one of my, my grade A's was IFA's. And I realized I only worked with three IFA's, but they were my most profitable clients. So what do I now serve? IFA's. It's an amazing market for me. And then I can reach out to them with a success story of how I've helped other grade A IFA's. So grade your clients, guys, and then create what I call your hit list. So create a list of 50 companies that you wish to serve. Now, one of mine was a company called 7IM. They've been on my hit list for about a year, and I won them this week because I, I was proactive with them. I knew they'd be an amazing client for me, and I've just won them on Wednesday. And I'm super excited because it's taken me a year to land them but they are a grade A client for me. And I think it's really important to know who are you targeting, why are you targeting them? So my grade A hit list are basically competitors of my grade A clients. And my, com my clients are very happy for me to work with their competition or they don't sign any non-exclusive or non-compete. And if they do, I'd respect it, but most of them don't. And therefore, I'm, I have the freedom to serve competitors of my clients. And, and if they're a grade A, I choose to do that. So as a thought, grade, your, grade all of your clients and start to understand who are you serving? Because so many people go after business that doesn't serve them. They pay you the least and give you headache. And that's not a clever business move. You wanna work with people that give you the most profit that you love to work with. Josh, can you ask me what's the question that's come in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tony. So uh, Tom was elaborating a bit more on the UCBs, so the unique client benefits. How do you project these to your clients without sounding like you're feature bashing? Yeah, great question. So many people feature bash because they'll just say things like, that I used to do, I used to go, we do bespoke training. That's a feature bash, as in we tailor it to our client. But the prospect would say, I don't care. So the way I turn it into a benefit is I think from the client's perspective. See, sales to me, guys, is not about you. It's about your client. And what they say is if you can see the world through your client's eyes, you're more likely to get your client to buy from you. So every time you deliver a message, think of it from your client's perspective. So to answer Tom's great question, I now say to my prospects, Everything I do is bespoke, which means I will answer your team's specific challenges, which means they will get better results and your bottom line will go up. So notice the two words I use, which means, and that turns any feature into an advantage and any advantage into a benefit. So I think Tom asked, how do you deliver this UCB? you know, in your business. So one of my clients is Manning Staten. It's a really big estate agent in Leeds with 19 offices. And they used to say to their vendors, their sellers, we have 19 offices. And the vendor went, good for you. And that's because it was a feature bash. So the UCB was, 
we have 19 offices, which mean we employ 126 negotiators that will sell your house, which means we sell it faster than any other agent in Leeds and we achieve the highest price for our clients. That's the UCB. So what you need to think about is what are the features of your organization, as in what do you offer? Then you need to think, what does that do for your client? That's the advantage. And the benefit is what do they gain from it? So the features, what you offer, the advantage is what they get from that. The benefit is what they gain personally from it, either them personally or their business. What do they gain? And that becomes your UCB. So great tip three, grade your clients and make sure you're fishing in the right pond. Are you targeting the right people? Tip number four, how do we stay in the forefront of our clients' minds and our prospects' minds? So the, one of the most powerful ways to do that is something called Google Alerts. Now, you might not have heard of Google Alerts, but when I learned about it, it transformed my business. So Google is such a clever tool that it can remind you of anything you want to be reminded about. So if you go to Google and in the search box, you type Google alert, it's a filter system and it will alert you about whatever you ask to be alerted about. So I've entered my email address there, obviously my name and my email. And I entered two things in Google alerts, my 321 clients and my 50 hit list prospects. And let me share the value and the power of this. About 10 months ago, Google alerted me. I got an email first thing in the morning that Jill Jackson, sales director of McDonald's Hotels, had left and she'd moved to a company called LGH that I've never heard of. So Google alerted me because McDonald's Hotels is my client. So now I understood Jill had left. So I phoned Jill that morning to say, Jill, I've, I've understood you've left. She said, how the hell did you know? I said, I take it's my job to know. So she, first of all, she was super impressed that I knew what's going on in her business. That's the first thing. Then I said, I understand you moved to LGH. She said, tell me about it. How come? She said, Tony, I'm delighted. I've wanted to move there for, for years. Um, although McDonald's was incredible, LGH is, is such a great brand. They look after the Marriott, Crown Plaza, blah, blah, blah. So that day, I, I phoned up into Flora and I got a bouquet of flowers delivered to Jill with a congratulations card. That doesn't hurt me, does it? Then a week later, Jill and I spoke and she signed me up for an academy and she spent £36,000 with me to serve LGH. And I also, she then spent a further £5,000 to speak at her conference. So immediately Google Alert has given me 41,000 pounds of business. What else came of it? Well, I said to Jill, who's replaced you at McDonald's? She said a guy called Simon Jackson. So I said, could you introduce me? Which obviously she did. McDonald's then booked me for another couple of days training through my new relationship with Simon. Then came the really clever bit. When I met Simon to do the work, I said, Simon, where were you before joining McDonald's? Fun enough, it was another hotel group that I didn't serve. Now, I don't work with them yet, but they're in my pipeline. And, and I wrote a post on social media about this. I don't know if you remember the Spice Girls song, but I'm not a big Spice Girls fan. But the, the song was Three Becomes One. And my post, I put a picture of Spice Girls and my post was one becomes three. Because just by having Google alert, one became three. One client became three. So not only does it help you stay in the forefront of your client's mind, but also it can create other opportunities. And I do the same for my prospects. So when I reached out to 7IM, um, a guy called Dean Proctor, the CEO, I was able to say, Dean, congratulations on the award that you won two weeks back. And I said, tell me more about it. It didn't hurt me that I knew that his organization, who wasn't my client, had won an award. 
So my recommendation, guys, it takes time, but set up Google Alerts for all of your clients and all of your prospects, your top 50 hit lists. The other way to build opportunities and stay in the forefront of their mind, which is what tip four is all about, is all about social. Where do your hit list hang out on social? So I mentioned earlier, my one of my niches is estate agents, but not any estate agent. I'm more niche than that. It's independent agents that have got between four and eight branches in the UK. And I, I serve all of those independents in the UK. And what I've realized is they all hang out in 17 Facebook groups. And I've now, I'm a member of all 17 Facebook groups. And I also, because they're my client, I know the biggest pain that they struggle with, which at the moment is they all struggle with lack of property, lack of stock. They've got loads of buyers, loads of tenants, but not enough stock. And I help my clients solve that problem. So what I did is I created 25 two minute videos of how I help my clients solve that problem. And I posted it every day in 17 Facebook groups. So my recommendation from you is think about your grade, your hit list. Think of, write down three problems you solve for your hit list and create video content. And if you're very uncomfortable on video, I'd say get over it and start videoing yourself. It doesn't need to be Spielberg production. Do a video one minute on, a, on a, your iPhone, buy a five pound tripod, buy a 10 pound light and video yourself, sharing how you can solve those problems and post them in the Facebook groups where your dream clients hang out. I now do that every day across five industries and I don't do that work. I delegate it to post it because it takes time. And let me explain why I do that, guys. It's a really important lesson that I learned from my mentor. And, and my mentor, Mike, told me this. Pilots don't serve drinks on the plane. So I pay someone £10 an hour to post those videos for me. This lady called Mimi, who's my VA, she adds my subtitles for me. She puts this background that you can see on the videos for me and she posts them in my Facebook groups for me. Why? Because my hourly rate is a lot higher than £10. So why would I do a task that I could equally delegate to someone for £10 an hour? So my question to you all, are you doing tasks that is below your pay grade? And I don't mean that rudely, but the pilot doesn't serve drinks on the plane. And, and I can use my time much more effectively by delegating tasks that I don't need to do. Because if I can build a franchise business where part of that is promoting video in social media that I can give to someone else to do, it serves me. Remember, the only thing I should be doing is income generating or opportunity generating. And my same mentor, Mike, said this to me, only do what only you can do. See, only I can produce this video, this specific video content, but Mimi can do everything else. So why should I be doing it? So you've got to be very strict. Nine hours a day, guys, is all we have available to speak to prospects or clients. Nine hours. Use those nine hours wisely because that's what top producers do. Um, and I've even gone a stage further during lockdown. I've set up a Facebook group dedicated to estate agents. It's called Heat, Helping Estate Agents Thrive. And what I do, because someone who knows social better than I do, is they've posted, thanks Josh, they've, they post my video in my Facebook page, and then they share that video across the 17 groups. And they do that, guys, so that I can build a database of estate agents. Because if it's on your page, you start to build a database of your target audience. So that's my recommendation, something you should think about. 
Um, start to really build content, guys. That's, pay, that's tip number five here. I know we've only got 15 minutes left, so I'm just going to rush the last couple of tips. Start to build content of how you solve your clients' problems or how you help them realize their goals. Written or video and share it in social media, in your blog, and use that wisely. Use that content. I remember about six months ago, just before lockdown, I was talking to a client of mine and he was talking about how his sales team are performing really well. And he said to me, Tony, I've just sent Adam, who was the sales director, on sales leadership training. And I'll be honest, I was a bit cheesed off because we do sales leadership training. So I said to him, John, do you mind me asking, why didn't you use us? And the words he gave me made me sick to my stomach. He said, Tony, I didn't know you offered it. Whose fault was that? My fault. And it made me realize how many of my clients don't realize what I actually do. And, and, and that cost me about 63,000 pounds because that's what he spent on sales leadership training with my competitor. And this client loves what I do. He was phoning to thank me because his sales team were doing so well. And I, I know I'd have won that business if he realized I did it. And it was my fault. And I made a commitment to myself that that would never happen again. And to avoid it, this is what I created. And I call it my product client chessboard. And it's a bit like Amazon this. You know, all of you buy on Amazon because it's the best business in the world, one of. And you know when you buy something on Amazon and you buy it and they say, clients have bought this, have benefited from. Well, this is my equivalent to my own Amazon model. So I wrote down my 321 clients down the side in Excel. And I wrote down the six different products and services I offer. And I put an asterisk by each client of what they offer. So if I take client one and his example, they've had, a, they've had all of my training, except they've not been on my apprentice day, which is my team building day that I offer. And they've not had my customer services training. So I'm now able to reach out to my client and go, by the way, Mike, when you get a complaint, who manages that? And Mike hopefully will say to me, my customer services team. And I say, what are you doing to invest in them to make sure they're delivering the best customer service? And hopefully he'll say, well, nothing. And now I've created an opportunity. So if you, if you believe some of your clients are in that situation that they don't know some of the products you do, create your product versus client chessboard. Write down all your clients down the side and look at all the products or services you offer at the top and just do an asterisk. What do they offer that you don't know about? And I, I helped one of my clients create this and I'm not exaggerating, it transformed their business. They're called Fortuna Healthcare. They offer, you probably, some of you will have used their product. 99% of chemists stock their product. You know, if, you've, if you, if you um, hurt your, your wrist, they do a, a wrist support. It's, they've got that lovely blue and red and white branding. As I said, every chemist near enough sell Fortuna products. And they offer about 2,000 products to their chemists. But I was noticing when I was dealing with their four ladies on the phone, they would say to their chemist, you run out of wrist supports. How many do you want? And the chemist will say, I'd like 15, please. And they would take the order and they would sell them. They weren't salespeople. They were order takers. And I said to the sales director of Fortuna, why don't you make them an order maker, not an order taker? And he said, tell me how. And I said, why can't they offer products that complement what you offer? So they offer this ice pack that fits anywhere on your body, like your wrist. And they've created an Amazon Bible, like I've just shown you. So now when they speak to their chemist, they say, clients of ours that order wrist supports also order the ice pack for wrists. Shall I add that to your order? Guys, they've increased their turnover by 63% by creating an Amazon Bible.
And remember, they got 2,000 products. So it's been a challenge to create the document, but it's worth every single penny. So my question to you is, do you have a similar document in your business? And most importantly, are you using it? And I want to finish on this, guys. Tip number seven, and I'd argue it's probably the most important tip I'm going to give you of how you can almost double your income, your turnover, and massively increase your profits. Just imagine this. So, guys, all of you now know what I do. I run a global sales training company called Tony Morris International. You know some of the people we serve because I mentioned it. Estate agents, recruitment, manufacturing, IFAs, technology businesses, the list goes on. Just imagine all of you swap jobs with me. So you no longer do what you do. So Rachel is no longer managing director of VHO, which is a concierge business. You are now managing director of Tony Morris International, a sales training organization. As managing director, all of you have got to go out in the next one week and win your first client. Who would you phone? I'd like you to write it down. Who would you phone, guys? You are managing director of Tony Morris International. This is a sales training company. And you've got to go out there and win your first customer. Who would be your first phone call? Now, it might be your business if you've got a sales team. If it's not your business, who do you know that has a sales team? Think about maybe previous places you worked. Maybe think about where your friends work. Do any of your friends run a business with a sales team? Any of your friends sales directors? or any of your friends in sales, because that'll be a good place to start. What about your family? Any of your family in sales run a business or a sales director that has a sales team? Again, great place to start. Just write it down, guys. And by show of hands, if you go to reactions, you can do your hands up. Just by push reactions, if you wrote someone down. Put, raise your hand in the reactions if you thought of someone you would phone. So Michael Garvey's raised his hand. Josh. Okay, Bill, a few of you. So guys, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. MT, brilliant. So quite a few of you. Ismail, brilliant. What I'd like you to do is this. I would like you just to write down my email address, please, which is Tony, T-O-N-Y, at TonyMorrisInternational.com. Just write down my email, please, everybody. Tony at TonyMorrisInternational.com. And what I'd like you to do, guys, is email the person you thought about. And I'd like you to copy me into the email. And I'd like you to say to them, hi there. I just had the most incredible sales training for the last hour. And I want to introduce you to Tony Morris, who's the founder of TMI because I believe he can help your business. And then say, Tony, take it from here. And I'd really appreciate that kind introduction. Clever, right? So guys, it's a nice way to get referrals. And the reason it works is twofold. One, you ask. Two, you swap jobs with you. So my last tip, guys, is this. First of all, I'd like those emails, please. Number two, though, more importantly, guys, I want you to speak to your clients, catch up with them, see how they're coping during this time and say this to them. Either say, can I ask you a question? Imagine we swap jobs and they know what you do because they're your client. And then say, who would you call? Um, Bill, yes, there is a referral fee. I give you £250. Anyone who introduced me to that becomes a client, £250 in your pocket. And if that's 10 clients, I'd be delighted to give you two and a half thousand pounds. Um, but on that, guys, speak to your clients, tell them to ask them to swap jobs, see who they think of. And then when they say, I'd phone a friend of mine, John, John Smith, because John does this, say, I'd love to speak to John. Get them to introduce you and it'll be the best, easiest client you ever win. 
And the reason top salespeople, guys, do most business by repeat and refer is this. Sales is about trust. And once you get a client to refer you, that referee trusts you because they come from a referred source. And then if they dare question your fees and they go, you sound expensive, can you move on your fee? You can say, that's why I charged Mike. And I'd be insulting Mike if I did a different fee to you. So not only do you convert better, but you don't move on your fees. And guys, I mentioned I won 7IM. How did I win them? Referral. They referred, I got a, an IFA client of mine to very kindly refer me because I didn't realize they just started using 7IM software. I found out about that because Google Alert and I got a referral introduction. As easy as that. And, and he did say, Tony, your fees seem expensive. Is there any movement? And I said, that's exactly what James paid. And he said, I can't argue with that. Guys, I really hope it was useful in the hour I had available. I've got obviously a lot more to share, but I only had an hour available to do so. I have a special offer for every one of you, but before I make you aware of that special offer, does anyone have any other questions they want to ask me on what I've said, or maybe a different sales question about your business that I can answer? Please write in the chat box or unmute yourself and feel free to ask me the question. Hannah, you said managing the list. I don't know what you mean by list. Do you mean your client database? Seems like a lot of different lists. Yeah, again, I'm not sure what you mean, Hannah, by lists. If I knew you wanted to introduce seven, I would have introduced you with Justin. Yeah, that's right. Justin is one of the founders, Hannah. Uh, sorry, uh, Neil. I, I've not met, so I'm dealing with um, the other C CEO of the company but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, guys, if no one's got any questions, let me, let me share this. So as you know, I run a sales training company and what I've noticed during lockdown, everything I now do is virtual and it's enabled me to, to create what I call my academy. And my academy is I've looked at all of the content I deliver and I've broken it down to 52 hours, 52 hours of sales content based on my framework, which is called the Ask Philosophy Principles, which stands for Attract, Solve and Keep. I help my clients attract the right leads into their funnel, solve the prospect's problems and keep them for life. And that's 52 hours of content. My academy is one hour per week on Zoom for 52 weeks, one hour a week for a year. So they're very bite sized you learn an hour, you take action, and then you join me the following week. I've also got five experts. I remember I mentioned the hundred I've interviewed. Five of them are delivering content during that 52-week academy. If you're at all of it's recorded, so you build up your own training library and you can refer back to it forever. If you're interested, guys, it's £197 per person per month. But because you're a member of BBF, I'm doing it at half price. So for BBF members only, it's £97 per person per month where you will get one hour per week with me where I'm going to share all of my best content every week. And you can tailor it to your business, I promise you. I'm doing it at the moment to estate agents. I have 47 estate agents on my group but I've realized I can tailor it to across vertical industries. So if you're interested, please either email me or email the team Louise or Carly at BBF, and I'd be delighted to work with you and help your business. That's going to start in November. I've already got, yep, healthcare industry. I've done a lot of work in the healthcare industry. I, I've worked with Vitality, I've worked with um, quite a few other businesses actually um, in, the, in the healthcare space. So I can absolutely help. So guys, if you've enjoyed it, my pleasure, Michael. Thank you for all of your nice comments. If you want some help um, to have the best year you've ever had, join me in November for the Academy, guys. 
Um, and, and part of the academy, guys, is you'll have access to TMI University. That's all of my online content. That's my five books I've written, 100 articles, 100 podcasts, and so much more. So thank you guys for your contributions. Yeah, oh, Hannah, Tony, so yeah, I'm just going to unmute Hannah so she can ask the question. Go for it, of course. Oh. Hannah, you still there? Yes, hello. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, get my question. My pleasure. Uh, you actually kind of answered it. <laughs> um, I was going to ask if there's any books you've written that I can um, try and get hold of, as well as like, managing the lists, actually, because you've spoken about making a few lists um, on Google. Um, yeah as well as um, the chess um, list. Yeah, product so line chess board. Quite a few. So I was wondering if you manage these lists by yourself or do you um, assign someone to like regularly have a look at them? That's a really good question, Hannah. So two things I do, I created them and then I've delegated to my PA to manage them. So as an example, I took on 7IM this week. My PA would have added 7am to my client list should have they booked me for my live sales call training should have done an asterisk on the product chessboard um so that i know when i speak to 7am i can speak to them about my management training and all my other courses so yeah I, I i delegate out the management but i created them in the first place because only really i probably i know the answers to those all of those lists to begin with that makes sense. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Hannah. And yeah, guys, my, my five books are all on my website, uh, tonymorrisinternational.com. You'll see all five books there. Coffees for Closers. My first book was an Amazon bestseller for telemarketing. Um, and I've also done an audio book. So you can get all of that on the website. But also that all comes complimentary if you sign up on my academy, as well as access to my university, guys. Um, as I said, it's my access to my university is also £97 a month, but for BBF, you have a special offer. Not only do you get the academy 50% off, but you get access to the university for free, all part of it. So it's about, it's about £300 a month normally, but for BBF members, just £97 a month. And I guarantee you, if you come on board and you, and you implement what you learn, I guarantee you will sell more. But you've got to take action. If you don't take action, I can't guarantee anything. So really hope you've helped. Any just to finish up, guys, any other questions at all that you want to just unmute yourself and ask or write in the chat box and I can answer just before we finish. Tony, just while we wait to see if any other questions filter through, um, I just had one going back to Tom's actually about the UCBs and Ooh. avoiding feature bashing. What if you've got several UCBs? How do you make the most of those? How do you use the right ones on a call? Brilliant question, Josh. So, you know, when if you think of UCB unique client benefit, not everything you offer will be a unique benefit to a client. Your job, therefore, is to find out which UCB is relevant. And the best way to do that is say to your prospect or your client, you know, so what I would say is when choosing a sales training company, what's the most important thing to you? And a client might say to me, Tony, it's vital that we have post training support. How are you going to make sure that everything you deliver is reinforced and the habits will be formed over a period of time? Then I would talk about my university and I would talk about my I set up a private WhatsApp group or Facebook group for every client that does my academy, bespoke training. So they're the two UCBs I talk about. But if they said something entirely different, I would share a different UCB. So I, I ask the question, what's a priority to you? What's important to you? And then I tailor my answer accordingly. So I hope that helps. Great. Perfect. Thanks. Pleasure. Any other questions, guys, about your business that I could answer of maybe that I didn't answer during this webinar, this session? My pleasure, David. Guys, really pleased you enjoyed it. As I said, there's only so much I can deliver in a certain space of time, but I'd be delighted to work with any of you that you feel I can serve. Um, as I said, I've already got clients booked up for the academy that's gonna start the 1st of November the first weekday in November. 
It's one hour per week for 52 weeks. And I promise you, everything is relevant for whatever business you're in. I've designed it that way. And all of you can take away things that you can implement into your world. So I hope to see some of you there. If you've got a question you want personally, ping me an email, tony at tonymorrisintestral.com. I'll be delighted to work with you or answer your questions. Um, alternatively, if you've got, you want to just start connecting with me, join me on social. I'm on every social platform there is. Um, or go on my website, tonymorrisintestral.com.